Um, we do probably have a couple more who are joining, but um, I think that um, quite a few of us are here. So um, I would just go ahead and get started. And um, so I wanna introduce um, Valerie, who's a senior loan officer with Mortgage Network with over 25 years of experience. And uh, we worked together many times before um, many transactions. And Valerie is a great resource if you guys, you guys have questions about like mortgage, how to get started, rates and mortgage trends and stuff like that. So um, she will also be uh, speaking a little bit during our event as well. Um, okay, sounds good. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. I have um, some slides that I can share with you guys. Let's see, I just started the screen share. Can everyone see? Yeah. Perfect, okay. Let's see, start. So yeah, this is the uh, Sander Home Buyer Seminar covering like pretty much all the basic stuff about home buying and also um, some of the general trend about Boston Real Estate this year. Um, so here's our outline. We're gonna be talking about like COVID-19 and what are some of the trends that we've been seeing with COVID-19 and also the, the greater Boston market. And also what is special specifically about the, uh, the greater Boston market. Um, and also a lot of question, a lot of people have questions about like sort of differences between suburban and urban markets. And we're, we are seeing some uh, differences in terms of trends last year and this year. So we will be talking about that as well. And also I'll be sharing um, my uh, own real estate investing experience because um, I think that a lot of people, especially the millennial generation, like um, one of our biggest group, biggest um, home buyer, buyer groups this year and last year, a lot of them are also interested in learning more about how to become landlords. So um, we'll be talking about some of my experience as well and hopefully that'll be helpful for you guys. Um, and we'll also be talking about like a lot of people ask what, what is the best time to buy and stuff like that. So hi Susan, welcome. Hi. Great, cool. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. So I'm Tanya Real Estate and um, if you guys want to learn more about the Greater Boston Market, you guys are welcome to check out TanyaWooRealEstate.com. So I've been blogging about the Greater Boston Market for many years and also like some tips about home buying, how to stand out from um, um, the, uh, the competitive seller's market and also how to prepare and how to sell your home and stuff like that. So if you go to my website, you will see a lot of resources about the, uh, the Greater Boston Market. Um, and then also I'm with Compass right now and currently we're the largest selling firm in Massachusetts with the highest transaction volume. So um, if you guys are interested, I can invite you guys to our platform because um, due to our transaction volume, we also have access to not only all the listings on the market, but also um, a lot of the listings are pre-market. That is listings are not put on the market yet, but that sellers are still preparing and stuff like that. We're able to show these listings to our own clients. So um, it is invite only. So I'm happy to um, invite you guys to the platform if you guys are interested and just share email and then it's all free and nothing, no commitment or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I've been a licensed real estate agent since um, 2015. And I'm also a real estate broker, which is a more advanced license than the uh, typical agent license. So it just means that um, I have not years of experience in the industry that I can uh, pass a rigorous test and also um, um, train other agent and open my own firm. And I also started my own property management company because I realized that rental can be kind of a pain for a lot of people starting out to be landlords or even people who are landlords for years or people like looking to rent places. It's, um, a lot of headaches dealing with um, a lot of things that sometimes people don't have a good perception about rental agents or property management companies. So that's why I started my own property management team because I want to provide good experience for not only my own tenants, but also um, my clients that purchase properties with me. I want to provide them with resources um, to help them manage properties <clears throat> and kind of provide a seamless experience for their tenants and also be there to be their counselor like if they have questions about you know, how to um, run this operation and stuff like that. And we also work with many vendors for many years that we, because of, we do a lot of business with them. So we send them business consistently. So they are able to provide us pretty, pretty competitive rates. And um, also because they have accountability to us that we've been working together all these years. Um, that we're able to um, have a pretty good relationship because the last thing we want is to work with contractors that don't show up on time, which is pretty common in Boston, or also just 
kind of not responsible, don't do a good job and then keep people waiting and then tenants getting angry because things are not getting fixed and stuff like that. So that's why we partner with good vendors. So our property management services are provided to um, people that purchase properties with me because um, we want to make sure we provide good service as well. So that's why we limit our services to um, our own clients. Um, I'm also a multifamily investor and which I'll be uh, talking more about in a minute. So you guys are welcome to add me on LinkedIn, Tanya Wu. I also have a YouTube channel. So if you guys um, prefer to watch videos and stuff like that to learn more about the market, you're welcome to uh, check out my YouTube video. You just type Tanya Wu on YouTube. Um, so yeah, that's my website. I'm actually working with a film company right now to produce um, a few films about like um, home buying is targeted specifically at millennial buyers. So um, we'll be releasing these videos once these are finished. So hopefully we wanna make real estate investing fun for millennials. Okay. Um, so yeah, about COVID-19 and the housing market. So a lot of people have been hearing that the housing market has been kind of crazy. And actually this has been the case since before the pandemic and during the pandemic and after the pandemic. But we, we are seeing some differences before and after. But um, it's interesting, this goes back to um, when I first started doing this business back in 2015. It was just a few years after the, the uh, recession and a few years out of the recession and the market was already crazy. Like um, every home that I tried to make offers on, I was 24 years old trying to buy my first home in Boston. And almost everything was like multiple offers, bidding wars. It was very intimidating for many first time buyers. So, and then every year it's been like this, 2015, 2016, 17, all the way till now, and even during the pandemic. But um, even though the urban market, some air, some sub markets became a little less compared, the certain population moved to the suburbs temporarily. Um, but then this year we're seeing these people coming back and then the urban market heating, heating up very quickly. So that's why I wanna assure people that I faced the same fear and anxieties when I first started buying homes as, as a first time home buyer. And, but then in many years of working with clients, I also have never had a client that could not buy a home. Once they identify the home, they're realistic with the budget and then we go through their options and then help them understand you know, what is within their reach and what is realistic. Um, I was always able to help all my home buyers buy their homes, even though the process could be intimidating. And even though some people feel like really stressed, you know, about like making, making more than one offer and not winning their first bid and stuff like that. So I just want to assure everyone that um, it's not as intimidating as it appears. But um, we, our Boston market has traditionally had this um, low inventory and high demand situation because um, we have very limited land and also highly concentrated and also very strict zoning laws. So it's not so easy for um, the zoning laws to allow developers to build like a crazy number of units. At the same time, that's also in a way a good thing for people that are able to eventually secure a home because you're not going to see all of a sudden an oversupply of inventory and then price drops and stuff like that. So the Boston market is a kind of market that you're not gonna see crazy price increase in, in any given market in one year, 20, 30% like we see in Florida. But you're also not gonna see something like, oh, something drops all of a sudden 20, 30%, and which I will show you guys the price trend as well so you can get a bigger picture. And also um, just that in the past five years or so, the construction speed did not keep up with population growth. That we still have you know, all these universities, all these jobs and stuff like that, um, but then people coming in, but then um, the construction speed just did not keep up. Um, and then also developers, because of the uh, scarcity of land, a lot of them tend to build like only luxury rentals. And because they, that guarantee them monthly, month, yearly cash flow, and then also yearly return. And then also because of construction costs for luxury units are a lot of times not that much higher than um, market rate units. So a lot of developers tend to build luxury units. So that also exacerbated the, the problem of lack of affordable housing. So that's one challenge that um, um, a lot of buyers have faced since um, 2014, I would say. So um, if you look at this article by Boston Globe, the demand for homes in Greater Boston is high, but few owners are selling. So this article came out in April, but actually since I've been in the business in 2015, every year I've heard a lot of things like that and have noticed you know, in my practice 
uh, this phenomenon of low inventory. And also another reason is that because of the issues I was describing, um, that it's hard for homeowners who want to upgrade into their second home to also buy a home. So a lot of times they, they're less inclined to sell. And then that also makes it harder for new buyers to buy. So that's why we kind of have a frozen market because of that. Um, but yeah, but still every year people are able to um, like find you know, what's within their reach and we just have to you know, always strategize and then make sure we do the right things to stand out from our competition and also identify markets that are within our reach. So people are still able to find homes that are within their reach. So yeah, multiple situation, multiple offer situation is um, pretty common. So I want to offer like two case studies. So one is the our urban urban case study. Um, so I use Jamaica Plain as an example because um, Jamaica Plain is this neighborhood that's um, a little outside Boston, but is still near the T. It's um, near um, the Orange Line. We're seeing a lot of young families and millennials um, moving to Jamaica Plain, and also a lot of them already live there, but more and more so gentrifying neighborhood like that. Um, they're very popular because they're very close to the city, but still in some ways within reach for people who wanna live in the city, have the urban lifestyle, but also don't have the budget to live right in the center of, for example, downtown or um, the more in demand areas in Cambridge. So we're seeing like this kind of, um, urban neighborhoods becoming really popular. And so I use this as an example. So um, total sale price increased by 13.7% since last year. And then on average 19 days on the market, although the more desirable units, a lot of them sell within a week or so. Um, like the average is about 2.6% over list price. But then um, what we're seeing also is that um, um, it depends on the seller's strategy. Some of them kind of price the home low in order to attract a bidding war or stuff like that. So the price is kind of unrealistically low. And then some actually list the home too high because they anticipated that that's not the kind of home that will sell very quickly. So they know they're not gonna get multiple buyers. So they're leaving room for people to, um, they know that buyers might try to offer lower in list price. So they price it too high, something like that. So that's why I would tell a lot of people that, um, the list price itself is often not a um, not a scientific indicator for actually how much you should offer. We should actually reference the uh, comparative market analysis, which is um, the pricing report that I will be performing for everyone who is interested in making an offer. Um, so that we'll talk more about that later. But basically, a report that shows you like approximately how much you should be uh, bidding because it could be below or above, but. Um, it's not really scientific to just go by the list price. And then so, so, Jamaica play market is described as very competitive. So many homes get multiple offers, some with wave contingencies. And we'll talk more about that later. So, um, so that's just one example and increased by 4.6% last year. And that was when uh, the urban market was kind of cooling down last year during COVID because a lot of people kind of you know work from home and stuff like that. And some we're seeing some migration trend from you know, the suburbs. But then I would say that even during that time, it still had a um, modest but a steady growth of 4.6%, showing kind of, um, in a way, the robustness of the, the Greater Boston urban market. So you can see that I'm um, kind of flat, you know, during the last crash, and then steady increase over time. And then another case study is um, what I would call like a suburban market where like we were describing how a lot of um, population moved to the suburbs and kind of making the suburb market extremely competitive. So almost 10% price growth in the last year. So Westford is the suburban town that's about, um, about 15 minutes drive to the city when there's no traffic. And of course the traffic could be a little longer. So it's kind of further out. Um, I was working with some clients recently and um, like, a lot of the offers that we made were like over 20 offers and stuff like competing against over 20 buyers and stuff like that. So that's just to uh, give you an indication of how competitive some of these um, suburban market can be. But of course, don't feel like discouraged or intimidated because these are just some examples. Because what I found is that in every neighborhood, there are always going to be homes that only got one offer. And there are always reasons behind it. It could be actually just 
that the the sales agent didn't stage it well, or that it has some um, the pictures were horribly taken, or some it could be just something as simple as that that people for some reason were kind of passing over that listing, or that it was listed too high for some reason people were passing over that listing, but that the home itself is actually really great, or it could be a variety of reasons. So sometimes there's just like hidden opportunities like that that um that we can look into. So I wouldn't be able like intimidated like and then stay away from certain neighborhood just because it seems to be really competitive. Um, so yeah, if you look at the um, Westford price trend, you can see that it was kind of a similar story as the urban market kind of modest growth before, but then during the pandemic last year in 2020, you see this sharp increase. Um, so that I described earlier explains sort of the sudden influx of people from uh, the city to the suburbs. Uh, in during the pandemic, but then interestingly, th this year we're seeing more people actually the urban market um, um, coming back to the urban market. So that's mm. interesting. Um, so yeah, why why invest in Boston? Because um, the home per the first home purchase is often the the biggest investment in our lives. So the biggest purchase in our lives, and um, so we want to talk about um, what makes Boston a compelling invest investment um, choice. So growing population, 12.6% um, increase between 2010 to uh, 2020. And that's according to the UC Census Bureau. And in 2018, it was ranked as the most educated state in the US. So many college graduates um, stay in Boston. We have a high concentration of universities and also um, increase of medium household income and also lower unemployment than every larger US city. Um, we're seeing a lot of expansions of industries. And then in terms of infrastructure, we have a wide, a wide variety of um, industries that kind of support, support the economic foundation. So we have healthcare, finance, biotech, universities, startups, and so on. Um, I would say very few US cities have such a balanced kind of diverse kind of industries all concentrated in, in one area. And then even to the point where the surrounding suburbs, um, surrounding towns also benefit um, from, from that effect as well. Um, most US cities, you know, either have one industry or not, not as many. Um, so yeah, consumer confidence and growing wages is also, um, these are also factors that contribute to um, the demand in the Boston real estate market. And then, so yeah, this is just a chart showing the uh, the rising medium income. And then also according to a UBS global real estate bubble index. So UBS is a European investment firm that research um, major, ci major cities around the world in terms of their um, bubble risk. So you can see that, um, this thing is blocking it, okay. Um, so you can see that um, Boston actually compared to most major cities in the world is considered quite fair valued. Mm. Um, you're seeing that a lot of a lot of cities like Toronto, Amsterdam, Paris, mm. um, Hong Kong also, um, or even like these are like bubble risk and then overvalued um, Tokyo, Sydney, New York, Los Angeles. That's um, when we study the uh, the income ratio and the income and also um, housing price ratio, then we study um, like in terms of the um, the affordability of the the median affordability of the local population and and how that's compared to um, housing prices. So Boston, like um, um, actually, is still ranked as fair value according to the research in uh, 2020. And then, so you can see how um, they rank all these cities mm -hmm. in terms of their bubble index. And also the number of years a flat of the same size need to be rented to pay for the flat. So Boston is actually considered relatively reasonable when compared to most major cities in the world. Um, and also, so pick Arlington as an example, it has the single family market that has the most growth of all the towns in Massachusetts, it has 79% growth since 2012. And also I recommend that you guys use the Zillow home price index. 
So although I don't recommend that people use a Zestimate or Redfin estimate because these are just based on algorithms instead of like act done by um, pricing analysis done by real estate professionals or appraisers, these are just computer algorithms. Um, they don't actually go into the house and evaluate, you know, based on, okay, the layout, you know, the lighting and stuff, because all these are factors that will affect the price of the home. Um, even though which way is facing is just use a very simplistic algorithm to uh, do estimate. But I do recommend the Zillow home price index because these were based on actual um, sale price. The homes that were actually sold, they use that to compile the housing trend. So I like to look at the historical trend. I don't, I don't ever look at Zillow forecast or, you know, mm. nobody can ever forecast how, how much increase um, an area will have. But if anybody says so, that's not, that's not accurate or reliable. Um, to kind of share about my, my own investing experience since um, um, some, a lot of people like want to learn more about you know, investing in Boston. Um, so yeah, when I bought my first home was uh, back in 2015 and then, so that was in Cambridge. And then uh, that same year was about like um, five to 8% price growth that year. So because of the, uh, the home price increase, I decided that I was gonna refinance my home to help come up with a down payment. And also I, I was working as a real estate agent at the time, so like saving money and also doing some side business, real estate related side business as well. Um, so then I came up with the capital to buy um, my first investment property, which was a condo in Cambridge. Um, it was like a two bedroom condo and then kind of 90s renovation and then um, I actually did, I only spent about like $4,000 or so to do some very simple renovation. I actually just painted the uh, cabinet white and then uh, repainted the whole apartment. I did everything myself with my own hands actually back then. <laughs> and then kind of change out the piping and stuff like that. All the cosmetic stuff that makes a huge difference in terms of how the apartment was perceived before and after. So it has some rent increase. So this is what it looked like after I did the renovation. So kind of before and after. Um, so a two bedroom condo bought it at a time for $440,000 $440, and current worth about five seventy four k and renovation about $4,000 or so. So it had an increase in values um, about 30%, of course, just estimated on the conservative level. Um, and then later that year, um, the second acquisition was the uh, Cambridge Free Family um, purchase that I purchased with a partner. Purchase price, 1.66 million. It was like a 10 minute walk to Lechmere. Um, also um, five to 15 minute walk to uh, Kendall Square Company. So a lot of expansions in the Kendall Square area so that I saw the potential. So it's attract renter pool, both from uh, the Kendall Square and also downtown Boston. Um, it's currently worth about 1.9 million, so about 14% increase in value since 2016. Spent about 11,000 um, renovation, mostly just um, the basic requirement. It was already a very good condition when I bought it. So uh, replaced the sewer pipes and also uh, fixing some uh, AC issues. So the cash on cash return on investment at 20% down because of leverage was um, 333,000. So the equity was about 252. And then, so it was about 76% increase cash on cash return over four years and, and not counting the rental income. So I think the power of real estate investing, really a lot of it comes from the leverage because we're not doing, we're not paying cash for um, these properties. We're doing 20% down so that when the property even increases about even increase 5%, that's magnified because you only put down 20%. And I think that's how a lot of uh, first time home buyers, once they buy the first home, and then because of the uh, increase in equity, they're able to refinance and buy a second home. So that's how we kind of um, build wealth over time. So kind of slow and steady game in some ways, but um, also powerful in its own ways. So yeah, that's what that building looks like. It's a free family in East Cambridge. That's what it looks like at the time. Um, so this is the second free family that I bought back in uh, 20, 2018. Um, it was also, it was, it was kind of older um, finishes like the gallery had back in the nineties. So it didn't look new. And then I did some uh, upgrades in terms of updating bathrooms and stuff like that. 
um, also added in unit laundry for all the units because um, that was something that was quite in demand at that location, but um, also quite rare. So um, I did that and also um, replaced all the HVAC into a Navian system, which you are seeing more increasingly, more increasingly common in new constructions and also some of the recent, recently renovated homes. Um, I also added bedrooms um, because I, I sense that the, the previous landlord was kind of, um, he was charging under market rent, also kind of mismanaged. Like when I first saw the units, I, like a lot of people smoking pods and then just, it was really smelly and bad and messy. <laughs> so, mm. uh, and also the building has some structural problems that um, uh, some investors kind of avoid for that reason, but that I will share more later. Um, so yeah, I pretty much um, fixed this building. I fixed the structural problems and um, added these bedrooms. Um, so yeah, modernized the whole building, kind of what it looks like. So yeah, three minute walk to um, Porter Square T. So purchase price, 1.6 million, spend $53,000 on the renovation. So including 25,000 for in-year laundry in three units and adding bedrooms recess lightings, repainting, also added, adding the French doors and bathroom cosmetics. So I added the French doors to allow renters to have the flexibility. So if they wanna put one more roommate, they can do that. Or if they wanna just open up the living room and bedroom and just make a one open space, they can do that. So it kind of provides more flexibility for, for renters. Um, and then also $10,000 for brick repointing. It was an interesting backstory behind it. Um, I actually bought that building for $200,000 below list price and negotiated down from 1.8 million. And the reason was that it was on the market for a long time because most investors were really scared by the structural problems. The building looked like it was gonna fall down or something because the bricks have not been repointed for over a hundred years. So when, when you have a brick building, like usually it requires repointing about 20 to 30 years at the minimum depending on the condition and the quality or the kind of bricks. But um, like the owner basically had deferred maintenance or previous owners had deferred maintenance for over hundred years. The building looked like it was not very structurally sound. So um, I actually got like mobile quotes of over $250,000 to repoint the whole building. And I used that to negotiate. But then I also study um, the bricks and then how it works and structurally and stuff like that. So I end up training um, contracts you do it for ten thousand dollars i use the same material that i that um, the professional masons use and then we're able to um, fix those structural issues and i hired two structural engineers to look at you know, the whole building afterwards and we confirm there's no no more issues and stuff like that so just to get two different perspectives two structural engineers so these are ways in which we can um, get something at below value some below market value sometimes and then add value of course, I have to say this kind of opportunity is relatively rare. For me, I only came across this thing like once every five years. Personally, I did not come across another opportunity like that, um, like exactly like that um, in the next two to three years or so. But yeah, these are just some examples. Um, so 18,000 for tankless energy efficient Navian boilers. So yeah, rent increase like because of bedroom counts have increased. So before renovation was 6150, after renovation was about 9,000. Um, so rent increased about 46%. And then also um, after the uh, fixing all these issues, we refinanced the home. Um, so, and also the price growth as well. So about 38% cash on cash return over two years in appreciation, about 172,000 increase in value since 2018. So these are just some examples of how when you buy a home, even when it's your first home, you can do things to add value to your home and then you can refinance later because when the appraiser come and look at your home again, they will see that you did these um, renovations that you did, did these improvements. But of course, not every kind of renovation will necessarily increase home value. There are certain kinds of renovations that are just over over renovate and then does not actually increase in value or maybe increase up to a certain cap. So we have to be careful about the kind of renovation that we do. I'm always happy to um, be a resource if you guys have questions and things like that about the kind of renovations you wanna do. And especially if you're a first time home buyer, um, we all know that the housing market can be kind of competitive and also most home buyers don't want to spend 
don't want to do renovation. They want just moving ready turnkey. But actually, if we can identify some homes that we can um, do even just simple cosmetic upgrades or even a little bit of kitchen, bathroom upgrades, that makes you feel happy and that turns the space into something you like. But then you can avoid competition because other people don't want to do these renovations and they're happy to refer contractors as well. So these are just the kind of things that we can do to um, to help reduce competition for us and also get good value when we're buying our first home. So now we're going to talk about the um, the exciting part, the, the home buying step. Um, and then uh, the first step is to pick an agent. And then uh, we'll talk about you know what you're looking for and stuff like that with your agent. And then we'll get a pre-approval letter. Um, so the pre-approval letter is the first step to uh, buying, buying a home. And I'm gonna have Valerie, who's our expert um, in mortgages, um, provide more information about how to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. Um, so a little bit about my background, just so you guys know where I'm coming from. Again, like Tanya said, I've got over 30 years experience in mortgage banking at this point. I've worked for all different size banks, the big banks, the small banks, the brokerage shops. Um, and now I'm at Mortgage Network, which I've been there for over five years now. And the reason I love Mortgage Network, we are a direct lender, um, which means we process, underwrite, and close the loan in-house. So these are some of the things people say, well, why, why is that important? That means we have control of the loan. We're not sending the loan out to another bank to approve the loan. Um, we offer many different products, um, everything from your conventional loans to your first-time home buyer programs, um, to your jumbo programs. So there's many different products we do or offer. If there's somebody who doesn't quite fit the guidelines, we can also send the loan out into one of our banks that we work with if we need to go that route. But we always try to keep control of it. Um, with that being said, I also work with the team. I have my own processor. I have my own underwriter. I have my own closer. And I have my own assistant. And we work together as a team. I'm always included on all emails to get your loan from application to the closing table in a smooth process. Um, with that being said, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the pre-approval process, which right now in this market, and I think Tanya will agree, is very important to get pre-approved. What that means is you get your financing set up with me, so you can actually get a letter from me saying you've been pre-approved and you can start shopping for a home. That's the basic understanding of it. Um, what we look at when I, when you, so if Tanya referred you to me, what I do is I talk to you on the phone for about five minutes and I ask you some quick questions as far as your income. How are you paid? Are you a W-2 employee? Are you self-employed? How long have you been at your job for? Um, how much do you have in assets? What are you looking to put down for your down payment? Um, What's your credit scores? A lot of people know credit scores now where years ago people didn't know their credit scores, just so I have an idea of what we're working with. Um, do you pay your bills on time? Things like that. Um, once I get a feel of what your um, situation is, is, then I email you what I would need from you. So again, W-2s, pay stubs, bank statements, whatever that may be. Once I, you get me all your information back, I pull your credit. Once credit's pulled, the pre-approval at that point, then what I do is I, I talk on the phone with you and I found out how long you've been at your current job for um, and make sure there's no large deposits on your bank statements. If there is a large deposit, um, I'm asking where the money came from. Are you getting any gift funds from family members, which is fine, but we just want to know we have all the facts. So I want to make sure that you are ready to go. So when Tanya is doing all this preparation to get you to go find a home, you're really ready to go. And that's the key. So it makes it so much simpler throughout the process. Okay. Um, some of the other things. Uh, hold on one second. Pre-approval is when we look at your credit score. Um, 
we can do loans, believe it or not, as low as a 580 credit score right now. Um, but if you're looking to get your score up, you can't, I can walk you through the steps on how to get your score up. I would have to pull credit first in order to help you do that. But we do have a process to give you ideas on how to get your score up. I can even tell people that before pulling credit. Um, as far as employment history, if you change jobs in the last two years, that's fine. That doesn't affect it. Again, we only look at the last two years. If you've only been employed for one year, and let's say you just graduated from school, that's fine. We just ask for your diploma to prove that you have been, you were doing something prior to, or if you weren't doing something, what were you doing? And you just write a letter of explanation. So we make it as easy as possible to try to get you into the home when you're out there shopping. A um, couple of things, again, we, I said, we look at the two year history. Um, we look at job stability. We look at the credit score. We also are going to look at any um, bonus income. I can use bonus income. I can use second job or part-time income if you have that. Um, so if that's involved. Uh, and what we do is we go through a calculation on how to qualify you to get you the maximum amount you're trying to qualify for. Okay. Um, again, gift funds are acceptable. We always want to know about large deposits, things like that. One of the other things, too, is I talked to you about the do's and don'ts of mortgage banking, meaning, um, for example, I always tell people, if you need to move money around, please let me know if you are, because that can affect it. If you're getting a gift, I want to know that. If you're got to make a major purchase. I always tell people from now until closing, if you have to go buy a car, if something major happens, God forbid you get in a car accident, and you do need to buy a car. Before you have them pull your credit, please let me know so I can make sure whatever the new payment is going to be for the car, it's not going to affect what you qualify for because that comes into play in qualifying you for the loan. Okay. So with that being said, people always say to me, how quick can I get pre-approved? So for example, I had someone today as they were asking me that specific question. And I said to them, how fast can you get me a paperwork? So I sent them the list today. I said, if you get me everything by the end of the day today, by tomorrow, you're going to have your pre-approval letter. I can do it within 24 hours. That's how fast we can have it. So what that means to you is you've got your pre-approval letter. You can start shopping with Tanya for a home and you're ready to go. The pre-approval letter is good for 90 days. If after 90 days you don't find a property, all I do is ask you for updated pay stubs and updated bank statements. And it's good for another 90 days. I don't repull credit the second time. As long as I repulled it the first time, I'm good with that. Okay. Um, as far as um, we're... As far as rates and so forth and what's going on, the rates, again, been doing this for 30 years. In the history of mortgage banking, the rates have never been so low. They are amazing right now. So um, we're forecasting, you know, the people above that I work for, they're saying we've got at least another year with the rates as they are. They say that, but Things can happen, especially like we didn't know a pandemic was going to hit last year and we didn't know the market was going to be so crazy. Um, but the rates have been good and steady for the, last, for the last two and a half years. They have never been this low, though, for the last past 12 months easily. So great time to be buying is now. Absolutely. Um, and that being said, um, the biggest thing is getting me your paperwork. I think that's um, what I said. If you'd be interested in doing something like that, I can definitely help with that. Um, Tanya, is there anything else you wanted me to go over? Is that? Um, yeah, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And I wonder if everyone else has any questions and stuff like that. Feel free to um, jump in as well. Right. Okay, um, 
Yeah, if people don't have any questions, I'm happy to move on to the next slide. And of course, if at any point, if you guys feel like I'm going too fast or have any specific questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, yeah, I have a tendency to get too excited and speak too fast, super fast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'll just go over um, the first step of home buying, like how to, um, like what, what do real estate agents do? Um, so in Massachusetts, um, if you're a home buyer, you don't have to pay any broker fee. And this is very different from uh, working with a rental agent because in Massachusetts, um, you do pay the first month rent typically um, to the rental agent if you're trying to rent an apartment. But actually, um, if you're looking to buy a home, you don't have to pay any broker fee at all. And this is because um, in Massachusetts, the broker fee is paid by the seller to the seller's agent. And then the seller's agent's agency was split usually 50-50 with the, um, the buyer's agent's agency. Um, so if the buyer doesn't have a buyer's agent, then the seller's agent would actually collect double the broker fee. So this is called a dual agency. So this is why um, all the buyers would work with a buyer's agent because there's no incentive for them not to work with one. In fact, if they don't have a buyer's agent, it's a huge disadvantage because then they don't have anybody professional to um, help them and prepare the paperwork. Um, so yeah, what a buyer, buyer's agent does is to advocate on the buyer's behalf, give you advice and schedule private showings and also help you strategize about the price. And I typically, I'm not all the buyer's agents do this, but um, I would do this thing called a comparative market analysis, which is a report that um, usually I spend several hours um, going over that. I also have a team member that actually helped me double check the numbers and you know, adjustments and stuff like that. Um, basically, this is an analysis that's very detailed and rigorous that goes over um, actual sold homes within usually 0 0.5 mile of that property. Um, we adjust that radius depending on the neighborhood. So if, for example, it's a suburban home, depending on location, sometimes we use a wider radius, like one mile or something. Um, and usually the data from the last six months to um, um, look at the comp. So these are called the comparative properties. Um, and then when we pick the comparative properties, um, we'll also adjust based on square footage or ceiling height, or whether it has a deck or not, whether it has a patio or not. Um, like, is it on a busy street? How far is it from the T? How far is it from the commuter rail? And if it's a suburban market, how far is it from a suburban downtown or certain highways and things like that? So all these factors um, play a role in how we adjust the, the homes because no two comps are exactly the same compared to the subject property, which is the property that you will make an offer on. So um, that's why we make adjustments on the comps to show what the property that we're evaluating, how much it should sell for if it had the exact same features as the comps. And then we take the average of um, that number from every column to come up with um, the estimate home value plus and minus 5%. So this is very rigorous analysis that so far has not been replaced by um, any machine learning, computer algorithms. Um, because there's also a lot of subjective factors like um, like the layout and you know light, how much light it gets and what kind of window it has and stuff like that. A lot of these things play a factor, um, play a role. And mm -hmm. then also um, sometimes like which agent sells the home can also affect the price as well. And then different agents have different um, pricing strategies like styles and things like that. So a lot of times we take that into account as well. But of course, these are sort of more subjective things and we like to separate the subjective factors from the more purely objective factors and which we'll also talk about. Um, so yeah, buyers agent also negotiate with sellers about price and terms and also rec obviously recommend lenders and home inspectors and attorneys. Um, we have really excellent lenders and attorneys that we've been working with for many years. A lot, of, a lot of times they can do things um, that help my clients offer stand out that many attorneys don't do, like, such as really fast closing um, and stuff like that. Sometimes it can make a difference when, um, when the seller is looking for fast closing and everyone else is offering some more pride and stuff like that. And having these things that really help your offer stand out would actually um, give you an advantage. Um, so yeah, also uh, give you advice about like contingencies and stuff like that. So um, yeah. And then what the seller's agent does that it advises the sell, they advise the seller about price and also marketing strategies and the stage the home for showings. 
and they also host open houses, which take place typically on the weekends. Um, so these open houses generally don't require appointments, although during COVID for several months, they did require appointments. But um, we're moving towards just open houses like before where people could just show up. Um, and then the buyer's agent can also help you schedule private showings if you're not able to make it to the open house. So yeah, sales agent also um, negotiate with buyer's agent to get the best price on behalf of the seller and so on. So people also ask like, how do you choose the right agent? So like the agent's experience is very important and also whether they're full-time or part-time, um, especially in a, a competitive seller's market, speed is very important because some homes can sell like, within a few days. So certainly you don't wanna trust somebody who has another job and has to wait around and stuff like that. Um, and also like whether they themselves have investment experience. I personally consider it quite important if I were shopping for agents because um, buying a home is like the biggest biggest um, investment in your life. So I, I, I would feel more confident if that person um, also cares about that aspect because eventually um, the average holding period for first home buyers in Massachusetts is typically between five to nine years. So eventually everyone sells their home, whether to upgrade to a second home or, you know, due to relocation and stuff like that, it can even happen faster within that time frame. Some people sell within three to four years. So I think having that investment mindset and vision and knowing that you're buying into something that, that has some potential, I think is quite important and also renovation experience as well. And also generally you wanna feel like you can trust the agent, like you don't want somebody who's like pushy or just tell you to do things that you don't feel comfortable. You do want somebody that you feel like you can trust and confide in and express your concerns and instead of being pushy. Um, so we talk about the uh, pre-approval letter. Um, so like in terms of neighborhoods, also to identify like things that are important to you, like the priorities, like some people care about schools because they have school age children. Typically um, for what I've seen for buyers under age 35 is that a lot of them either don't have children or have young children. And then you wanna think about like, okay, it might be another six years before my, my first child attends public school and before the school district becomes relevant. And if that's the case, typically suburban towns on average have higher property taxes than um, um, condos in the city, for example, then in that case, you might want to think about, do I really want to pay you know, a couple of thousand or a few thousand dollars more in property taxes every year um, for the next five years or so, even though my kids don't attend private schools? So that's another thing to think about. Um, we also talk about whether Zillow, Trulia, Refin estimates are reliable sources. So I mentioned earlier that um, um, a lot of these, I personally, I, I don't look at that because um, for the predictions, because they use computer algorithms instead of actually visiting homes or looking at pictures or taking into um, account a lot of more or less subjective factors because some um, real estate is a lot of the psychology as well. So a lot of the real estate, a lot of times real estate prices are affected by um, certain human components that I feel that current technology has not been able to capture. Um, so yeah, I do look at data um, past appreciation, such as the Zillow Home Price Index, but I don't look at future appreciation. Um, so in terms of making, making an offer, um, so process of making an offer is that you work with your buyer's agent and then typically prepare the, off the offer um, contract and then that states the purchase price and also how much deposit. Typically there's a uh, $1,000 buying and deposit that you only submit if the seller accepts your offer. So if the seller doesn't accept your offer, then you don't submit a deposit. And then there's a seven day period to sign the purchase and sale agreement. So typically in the standard um, home purchase, home offer contract, there's a inspection contingency which means you're, the buyer is allowed to hire the, an inspector to conduct a home inspection on the entire home uh, within seven days of offer acceptance. And if they don't like the result of the inspection, whether it could be a small thing like some minor leaking or garbage disposal not working or things like that, or larger issues such as um, structural issues, and in which case I would actually sometimes advise my clients to back out from transaction. But if they find, any, anything unsatis unsatisfactory, then they can back out from um, the transaction and they can get their deposit back. So this is why a lot of times 
sellers, when they receive mobile offers, they like to choose from uh, offers that have inspection contingency waiver, because that means that the buyers would move straight, straight to the PMS. So they don't have the opportunity to back out from the transaction and get the deposit back. And the reason is not that the sellers just want to trick the buyer or force the buyer to buy the home that they don't, if they find out they don't want later, it's more that um, because they have a lot of buyers to choose from. And for them, if the home is put back on the market after the buyer backs out, then it stays on the market longer. And people might wonder, oh, what's wrong with the house and stuff like that. And actually I, will, I find that sometimes first time home buyers get cold feet. Um, especially after they go through many bidding wars, they, you know, each time get more and more aggressive. But um, some people, and like after they win the bid, next day wake up, they're like, "Oh my gosh, I paid too much for the home. I want to back out." It, not because of anything rational, whether they find out more information about the home, but more like emotionally, they are responding, they are reacting emotionally because um, it's like a buyer's remorse kind of situation. They feel very stressed and. Um, stuff like that. So some people do experience that. And for that reason, when sellers work with first time home buyers, they might feel that that's more risky. So um, that's why sellers often um, prioritize buyers that waive inspection. Um, even as recently as this Monday, when I made um, actually two offers for clients, um, I would say actually one for one offer um, was like a condo in Jamaica Plain, a three bedroom condo. That one, they received nine offers and then all of them waived the home inspection. So it was, it was very competitive. Um, but sometimes it's just like a few people waive it or maybe one or two waive it and stuff like that. Most sellers still care the most about the price, but um, it's like a total, total package. Like when you're applying for college, you look at your essay and interview and test score, your grades and stuff like that, look at everything. So that's the same thing with buying a home. And a lot of times the process is comparable to applying for colleges and admission, college admission rate, very similar actually to, to a Harvard, applying for Harvard sometimes in terms of the ratio of buyers and, and seller. Like if you're looking at 20 people bidding for one home, that's almost like applying for Harvard. So um, these are things that, that we look at. And then um, after the seller receives the offer, you know, with approval letter and all these doc documents, um, Typically they get back to you within a day and sometimes when uh, there's multiple buyers with similar prices, they might give everyone a chance to um, bid a second time. So that would be a call for a second round of offers. And sometimes, which happened also recently this week, I have seen a, um, a buyer that offers substantially higher than all the other buyers, then the seller just straight up pick this person. They don't want to take any chance of losing this buyer because this buyer bids substantially higher than everyone else. So in that situation, they won't even give you a second chance at all. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of, um, of a rejection letter of thank you for submitting your offer for this home in Framingham, received total, a total of 14 offers. But unfortunately, the seller decided to go with a different offer. So this is a kind of email that you will get if the seller doesn't take your offer. But then of course, it's very exciting to be that person where the seller, after you go through so many things and you've done all your research and then you may have bid more than once and you finally win something. And there's that excitement when somebody accepts your home and then you're finally ready to move on to the next stage. There's also that kind of letters as well. So um, definitely every bid represent a new, new chance, new hope. Um, so yeah, in terms of like different kinds of property types in Massachusetts, there's condos and townhouses. So these have HOA fees or what's called the homeowner association fees. So you'll be sharing like um, a lot of maintenance duties with other units. And then um, there's also multifamily. So this is very common in Massachusetts because um, we have such a long history of housing when the population was quite dense. So a lot of family used to live together in the same building and divide their homes into several units. So, but these days, a lot of these got converted into condos and sold separately. So that's what we call two deckers, triple deckers or row houses. And then, so you can buy the whole multifamily building and we can live in one unit and rent out the other units. So then your tenants can help, help you pay for mortgage. And I personally like multifamily for investment because um, the uh, tax rate for the whole multifamily building, for example, if you're looking at a two family, the tax for the two units, but the whole 
the whole building is actually lower than you when you buy two condos separately. And also because when you're an owner occupant, you get a lower interest rate than if you're an investor. So if you buy the whole multifamily building, then you basically get a lower interest rate on the other units in the same building as well. So that's another advantage from a um, mortgage and also a tax standpoint. So yeah, single family, then that's a, a, another property type. Um, some people like to have total control of the whole building. They don't like to share, but at the same time, they don't mind doing the maintenance, the yards, no removal themselves, then they will buy a multifamily. Um, so what's in an offer? So we talk about the binding deposits. Um, so the earnest money is the 5% deposit that you pay after your offer is accepted and you sign the person's sale agreement. And so that, and then you subtract the $1,000 that you already paid. So we talk about the uh, inspection and mortgage contingencies. So um, a more contingency is another thing um, in the offer that sometimes, you know, in a very competitive situation, people might waive a more contingency, although I would say that's far less common than um, inspection contingency. And that's basically to protect you and protect your deposits if for some reason you cannot get a mortgage anymore. So I always advise my clients to keep this contingency whenever possible. And in the extremely competitive situation it was like a deal breaker down to the point where you're compete you're down to the last round and the seller say okay we now pick up the best two offers you're one of the best and you're competing with one other offer everyone else is out and then the deal breaker is only if one of you is willing to weigh the more contingency um, in that situation we can discuss whether whether it's worth it or not in, in some cases just I in your situation I would advise you not to do that. And in some cases, you can also do this thing called the appraisal contingency waiver. Um, appraisal contingency waiver is when um, um, you, you will still be committed to um, buying the home if the appraisal comes low. So the appraisal happens when um, you get a mortgage and the bank will assign an appraiser to appraise the value of the home. And sometimes in a, a rapidly appreciating market because uh, home prices are rising faster than the uh, the housing data. And the reason for that is because we mentioned that when we do the market analysis, the comps was pulled by from home sold in the past six months. So um, if the appreciation happens like in the past month or two, and typically it takes 30 to 45 days and sometimes 60 days for a home to close for the price to become pub publicly available. And because of that, the price has not been captured by our analysis because um, while the home is still under agreement, but not yet closed, the price is not revealed, cannot be revealed by the seller's agent. So that's why sometimes the appraisal comes low. So in those situations, um, the seller would prefer that um, the buyer waive the appraisal, not that um, they want to take a deposit, but more like they want somebody who can commit to buying a home. And so when a buyer waives the appraisal, then they are basically committing to covering the difference um, for example, if the home is appraised at 650, but then you're paying 670 for the home, then the, the buyer is committed to paying $20,000 for the difference, um, basically increasing their down payment and still buy the home. And they still get a mortgage, it's just that they're increasing their down payment. So that's what happens. Um, so yeah, and then also you offer specify how much down payment and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we'd also talk about the buyer's remorse that sometimes it happens that people are really stressed about buying a home, um, but they experience this low point after this moment of excitement of being told that, um, congratulations, you just won the bid and um, against 10 buyers, for example. Of course, not every transaction is this crazy. Sometimes it's just two to three. Sometimes you're only the only buyer, but some of the people do experience this low, low point that tend to happen the next morning when people wake up and realize, huh, I just want a home, <laughs> that kind of feeling. But uh, it doesn't happen that often, but uh, once in a while, just something that I warn people in advance. And I would advise everyone that if you're not 100% sure that you want to commit to this transaction or that you're 100% sure you want to buy this home, do not make an offer because it can be kind of stressful to back out in that case because you're risking your $1,000 binding deposit. Um, so best time to buy 
in Boston, it's actually a pretty consistent. So I would say this is old data because that was before the pandemic. This year we're seeing, last year, for example, we're seeing the market de delaying for about two months. Um, so some people say that for rental condos, this applies mostly to condos because in the suburban area, it's um, less consistent. But um, for condos, a lot of times you see that because after the August 31st, um, the August 31st timeframe and when leases end and landlord will clean up and renovate a property and put a home on the market. So you see a little bit more inventory in September. But then of course, that in terms of the total numbers of home available, that still doesn't compare to the summer when there's the most inventory to buy. So um, you see a little, a little spike during that period, but um, most people still buy in the summer and they have the most properties to choose from. But that's just an interesting phenomenon to explore. And of course, every year is kind of different. This is just some old data. Um, and then best time to sell January when there was a lease inventory. So my first home, um, actually I bought it in January back in 2015. It was a very difficult time to buy because very few people wanted to sell their home and move in the winter. And it's very um, challenging to um, move in the winter time with the snow and stuff like that. So some people argue that January is the best time to sell. But of course, actually, in my all these years of experience, I would say every property is different. And then the same thing with the previous chart, depending on what kind of home that you're looking for, that chart may not apply. So this is just something for your reference, an interesting phenomenon that we sometimes see. But um, of course, every everything is case by case. So yeah, we have come to uh, the end of our presentation. Um, so I, I don't know like, if you, have, you guys have questions and stuff like that, I understand that. Maybe a lot of the information is new here. So um, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or want to give any feedback and stuff like that. I uh, found this very helpful. I'm fairly new to the housing market, but uh, there's a lot of information here. Uh, Great, I'm glad you find it helpful. Yeah, and um, also you guys all have my uh, either Facebook or email and stuff like that. And of course, um, if you're new to everything, feel free to contact me or check out my website, tanyawurialstate.com. Um, and also my YouTube is Tanya Wu as well. Um, so yeah, if you guys also, some people prefer to ask questions privately as well. So feel free to message me, email or call, text, anything like that. Um, and then uh, if you're interested also in being set up, being invited into the Compass platform to see like our listing was available and stuff like that, feel free to message me later as well. Cool, does anyone have any questions? Great. Cool, yeah, I'm just so happy to um, share all this information with you guys. And I'm so honored that you guys joined this presentation. I know the Wednesday evening, a lot of people prefer to um, eat their dinner or watch TV or something. So I'm definitely very happy that you guys were able to join. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions and stuff like that, need any help, feel free to contact me. And um, I hope you guys have a nice rest of the evening. You too. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Okay. Bye. Okay.